Well, good morning, Resonate. Let's try that again. It's been a long week. Good morning, Resonate. Good morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing and give praise to our God this morning. Forever he is faithful. Amen. seated. Oh, you're making them sit down before I get up here. Hey, Resonate, how y'all doing? Hey, 
Resonate, how you doing? Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. I, I knew that I was like a couple seconds before my time. Uh, so welcome to Resonate Church. If you didn't know that's where you were, well, you know, you should have checked your... Uh, your Google account or something to figure out the right place. Resonate means to be filled with something and then resonate it out, to reverberate it out into the community. We believe that we need to be filled with God's spirit and his love and then resonate it out to the community around us. So that's sort of the idea of resonate. And we keep on saying that so that you guys will understand it. Uh, we have some announcements. Now, some, some things sort of overload my mind. And one of those things is the schedule. Uh, and as Christmas time comes nearer, uh, that schedule gets a little bit crazier. So um, we have a little bit of a guide situation that we have set up, and you may see someone stalking me behind my right, my right shoulder. Uh, so let me introduce to you a, a guide for one specific weekend uh, coming up in two weeks. All right, so what's going to happen in a couple of weeks? We have a really big, busy uh, weekend in the church calendar. Not this coming weekend, but the following, the 17th and 18th. We have three special events that we want to let you know about. On the 17th, on Saturday, you have the opportunity to go caroling to a few local nursing homes. What we're going to do is we're going to meet here first at 1, and we're going to put together some cute little ornaments so that we can bring little gifts to the residents. So we're going to start here at 1 and make the ornaments, and then we'll be caroling by about 3.30. We are asking that you dress um, for outside or perhaps inside, because at least one of the nursing homes that we'll be visiting is requesting that we stay outside due to viruses and germs, and so we'll be caroling at their windows, so they'll open the windows for us and listen to us carol. So make sure that you're dressed appropriately to do either or. So, especially uh, with a nursing home, because it's going to be like 90 inside <laughs> and possible. 10 outside. So. Yes. so that is the 17th. That's Saturday, and there is a sign-up sheet out there uh, to sign up, just so that will give us an idea of how many groups we need to prepare for the nursing homes. So that is Saturday. On Sunday morning, we are going to be thrilled to hear our kids sing their Christmas musical during the church service. So please make sure that you're a part of that. It's always so precious. I love that part of the, the season. And then Sunday night at 6.30, we have our annual Christmas Resonate Family Show. So I hope that you're working on your accordion skills or juggling or whatever you want to do. You're putting together your act as your family. Uh, maybe it's a skit. Maybe it's a poem recitation. Maybe it's a song that you're singing or playing, but regardless of what you are doing, we would love to have you part of our family show on Sunday night, the 18th at 6.30. I do need you to sign up for that, too, just so that it doesn't become four hours long. Amen. Nobody wants that, as cute as they all are. Um, so make sure you sign up for that, and we'll make sure we'll get the sound all figured out as well. If you have any questions about that event, come to me. If you have any questions about Sunday morning, um, the children's uh, show, come to Kim. And if you have any pro questions about the Saturday nursing home event, go to Hayden Rasmussen, who is right back there by the door. Wave your hand. There's Hayden. All right. Thank you. Cool. Uh, and then the following week, of course, uh, it's Saturday evening, we'll have our Christmas Eve service. Several people have been asking about Christmas Day, since Christmas is on a Sunday this year, are we going to have service? And um, so I, I looked at my calendar, and what I realized was that this last year, Easter was on a Sunday, and we still had service. So <laughs> thank you. All right, so th hopefully that answers your question. Uh, uh, we, of course, there's a lot of stuff that's going to go on between now and, now and then. One of the things that we're doing with the men's group uh, and I'm, I'm honored because they sort of named this, uh, I guess, with some of my inspiration. The new men's group evening is going to be trough. What's it called? Men's Feed Trough Night. Men's Feed Trough Night. Uh, and that's going to be at uh, Golden Corral the second Tuesday of every, no, second, second Tuesday of every month, all right? So go and, and belly up to the bar um, for, for that. Um, so do we have that picture? Do we have the picture that I asked for? There it is. All right, so this is a new room down the hall. This is the grace space, all right? You see, that, and that is uh, next to the, the, uh, the nursery area, and its specific use is? Okay, so that is that space. Um, it's really cool, that's, and that's like a current picture just a couple minutes ago. Um, thanks for everybody that, that helped make that possible. It's a nice spot. Um, we have, let's see, the kids thing coming up in a couple weeks. Um, 
there's uh, Bible studies going on. There's a, there's a girls' Bible study. Uh, if you have questions about that, it's Chloe's doing that. Um, there's other stuff. Um, am I missing? What else? Oh, there's the sign up for uh, districts. Can you put that one up, please? Yeah, districts. Uh, yeah, just guide me through the announcements. Districts, January 13th to 15th. Um, talk to Jesse about that. Is there another announcement up there that I'm supposed to do? Uh, yeah, I got that one. Next one. Uh, yeah, y'all have the books. Hopefully, if not, they're on back order. So sorry. Oh yeah, that's right. The prayer. Um, we're going through a prayer class on Sunday morning, 9:15 to 10:15. We're talking about prayer. Right. So um, we're doing that. You're you missed the two weeks, but that's okay. You can come on the third week. We'll let you pray then too. All right. So so next week we're still meeting, and then the following week, the 18th, that'll be our last official time. Although we're probably going to continue. Along with that comes the prayer meeting tonight, 6:30 tonight. So please come back. Youth is still going to meet, as far as I know. The Standardworks are on their way back from uh, Kentucky. So they should be back in time for Ute tonight. Uh, and then we're going to have our prayer meeting at 630 uh, also here tonight. All right, I think that's all the announcements. Uh, so I'm going to move into our three questions. I'm usually down there, uh, so I, I may jump off the stage at some point. But um, we, we do this thing called three questions here. We believe that God speaks through His Word, through His people. He, he speaks through His Spirit. So we, we like to read His Word and see what God's going to teach us. And we, we like to involve everybody in that because God speaks to you. So therefore, He can speak to us also the same way. So what we do is we read the text and then we ask three simple questions of the text. The questions are very simple. What does this passage teach me about God? What does this passage teach me about myself and my community? Third, learning these truths, what should I do to apply those things to my life, all right? So what does this teach me about God? What does it teach me about myself, my community? How do I apply it to my life? Those are your three questions. The passage today is in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, and here's what it says. He says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession... I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So there's the passage whole bunch of stuff to chew off there. Uh, they're going to continue to scroll it behind me. So it's up to you. What does this passage teach you about God? Your turn. What does it teach you about God? Yes. He gives life. That's what he said? He gives us, he is the source of life. It says it again in John chapter 1. He is life. What else does this teach you about God? I saw a hand over here somewhere. She's, oh, we have a thief. All right. He has eternal dominion. He has eternal dominion. Not something that passes, not something that just ebbs and flows. He has eternal dominion. Steve? Only God is sovereign and almighty. Only God is sovereign and almighty. He's the only one with full dominion. What else does it teach you about God? All right, short stories today. All right, Edgar Allan Poe time. Yes, yeah. God is immoral. He cannot die. He cannot be born. All right? He is from everlasting to everlasting. So here's your story. God, God is the immortal, uh, everlasting God. He's the only one who spans all time. He's the only one that has life. He's the only one that can give life. He, is, uh, he, is, he has dominion over all, and that dominion it has always been, and it always will be. He is the one that's in charge of everything. Now, question number two. Let's see if you can turn it into a second question answer. Uh, what is this? Because my wife raised her hand after I was already going. I know. I'm used to it. Uh, so, second question. What does this passage teach you about yourself and your community? Okay, so we can be in the presence of the Lord even though he dwells in unapproachable light. You have an invitation. What else? You have no life without Jesus. Steve. We are, we are to keep his commandment until he appears, which is one of the things we're doing up here 
um, today also. Uh, what else does it teach you about yourself, your community? Another short story, all right? So even though God has all dominion, he's immortal, he's all-powerful, he allows us to come into his presence. Now, he also wants us to do certain things. That is, obey him, live life through him, because we can't have life through anyone other than him. And to make our life the best possible, that means we need to obey him until he returns, all right? So there's your second question. Now, okay, go ahead. And all honor that we may think we have should be then poured upon him. All right, now, third question, and uh, Tim, you guys can go ahead and mosey back up here. Um, third question, knowing these truths that you guys just discussed, how should we respond? What should we do uh, to craft our lives in accordance with these truths? Start these off with I will. I will what? I will. Yes. I will honor the Lord. I will, yes, I will spend time with the Lord, I will, I will obey his commandments, I will, I will continue to anticipate his returning, I will, I will worship him, I will, I will magnify the Lord. I will make him bigger and bigger in my life as days go by. I will. Uh, see, that hand came up. I know you're taking off your jacket, but that'll get you called on. <laughs> I will. Anyone else? Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you speak through your word. Thank you that you speak through your people. You are an amazing God. You're the immutable one. You're the one that has life, that will never change. You deserve the praise that we give you. We will magnify you. We want to make much of you today. We know we are little. We want to make much of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship again together. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let's go. 
<laughs> Could I have the uh, ushers come forward for offering, please? God, we, we thank you for inviting us to come, all who are unfaithful, all who are tired, weary, broken, and you include us in your throne room. You're amazing, God, to give gifts as you have given, and gracious to only expect such a small amount in return. So God, as we continue to worship you and we pass these wicker baskets around an auditorium, uh, we pray that everything that goes in them will be seen as a gift to you for your service, for your ideas, and for your outreach. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So y'all can y'all can be seated. That's fine. Um, Tracy, can your your guys, whoever you have here. So as we come to this table, we do something as y'all uh, sort of discussed a while ago that we're going to continue to do and obey until the Lord returns. Um, these are elements that are fairly simple to see, um, flour mixed with water and oil and juice that happens to come from a grape, very simple elements, but they're descriptive of something that is so much greater. Um, I want us to get an idea because we always say sort of the same thing, you know, don't take these unless you are prepared. So as I am talking as I'm like sermonetting here. Uh, if you need to prepare your heart, if you need to prepare your soul uh, for taking of these elements, please take the time now to do it. Uh, because what, what we do here is not the actual body, the actual blood of Jesus Christ. We know that's not the, the truth, but it is representative of that. So we do it representing those things until he returns. But still important, I want I wanted to look, just look at something Quickly, in the uh, book of John, second chapter, we have a, a, an interesting story about Jesus where he has his first miracle done at Cana Galilee at a wedding, and he turns water into wine. I want you to understand that miracle in terms of this, what we're about to do, the miracle that you're about to see as well. What Jesus did in that, I don't want to be uh, misunderstood as you know him being the first bartender that actually, like, tops off the kegs and, and passes around for a high hallelujah. What he did was very symbolic. I want you to see into what Jesus was doing and why John put that miracle, strangely enough, at the beginning of all the miracles of Jesus. What he did was he used these stone jars that were used for 
purification, ceremonial cleansing. After you did all these wicked things and after you got drunk and after you did whatever you did, you could go and wash your hands in these stone jars filled with water and signify that you had been cleansed. But all it did was wash away dirt that's on the outside. Picture what Jesus did. He said this, those things that you used to approach, that stone jar that you used to approach so that you could just wash off your hands doing absolutely nothing because you're still filthy on the inside. The stone jars you used to approach with reproach because you knew that you could do anything and still cleanse yourself on the way out. I'm going to use those stone jars that you used to use to clean falsely the outside. And I'm going to use the water that was inside. I'm going to turn it into wine, representative of my blood, which now you're going to ingest. And you're going to take inside of you because the only true change that happens is from the inside to the out. There's nothing you can do on the outside that will ever cleanse you enough to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. However, his blood that was sacrificed for you, if you take his life inside of you, because that's what blood represents in the Old Testament, for the life is in the blood. If you take that life within you, it will change everything on the outside of you. Amen? That's the miracle that's represented in what we're going to do today. That's why he says, do this in remembrance of me until the time that I come. So here's what he says. This is in Luke 22, starting in verse 19. He says, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He says, I'm going to give you my body as a sacrifice because nothing that you can do will ever be sufficient for a sacrifice. And since my life, my blood is life, you're never going to be able to live unless you have my blood within you. So that's what he's signifying here. So we're going to pass these out. Are y'all doing three and three? Is that what you're doing? Okay, so there's, there's the bread. It's each one taking one, I guess. And wait, and go ahead and you're going to take these two at the same time.
And I know he has a place for me. Oh, what joy will fill my heart. Oh, with the saints around the mercy seat of God. Come all you weary, come and find. His yoke is easy, His burden light. He is able, He will restore at the table of the Lord. Come all you weary, come all you weary, come and find His yoke is I'm invited to the table of the Lord. He says, come just as you are to his table. Come all you weary, come and find his yoke is easy. His burden light, for he is able, he will restore at the table of the Lord, oh, at the table of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. You are good. You are gracious. You are all powerful. Lord, we come to the table this morning, feasting at your table. Lord, we know that we will not hunger. Lord, we know you. We will not thirst if we know you. Lord, you are our living water. You are our daily bread. God, we thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So he invites you to his table. If you've accepted that invitation, you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're welcome at the table. He gave his body, he gave his life, he gave his blood. And that night he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you, it is the new covenant in my blood. What an amazing God to come from the glories of heaven to submit. At this time of year, we think about your birth, to submit to birth, to the struggles and the innocence, the humility, the weakness of a child, to submit to that. Always having your mind and your eye on the cross and the sacrifice you had made, knowing that the cross would pay for sin, but the empty tomb would give us life. We celebrate you today. Thank you for the life that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to gather all my stuff here. As you know, Jesse is gone this, uh, this morning. They are on their way back from Kentucky. They went to the ark. Uh, but we're not going to talk about the ark today. We're going to talk about um, preparation. All right? um, and we're, uh, hopefully some of you have been using the uh, study guide. Uh, who else is using that study guide? Let me see. Anybody? Anybody using the study guide, the Advent study thing? Anyone? All right. Uh, it's actually pretty good. It goes through the um, it goes through the the names of Jesus, and then it has a weekly um, topic. And so, what we're what we're going to do, what we're tracking through, at resonate is we're following through those topics as sort of the jumping off point for uh, a sermon series. So, the sermon series is go ahead and pop it up there. The sermon series is the names of Christ. Uh, the names of Jesus, unwrapping those names. Um, and then we have certain topics. Last week was hope. This week is preparedness. Let me make sure that's not Jesse talking to me. No, it's not. Uh, oh, and y'all should always, when you walk into a church service, you should silence your phones. That's what, as I remember to do that. Uh, so anyway, this week is preparedness. So the, the topic, the title this morning is preparedness, preparing the way. And we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 40, Uh, specifically we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, but I'm also going to take you into Matthew, we're also going to go to John, and then we're going to come back to Isaiah chapter 40 at the end, because I think there's a contextual thing that that we need to talk about just so you can see and so you can visit the pathway within which these five verses are spoken. All right, so so that's sort of where we're going to go. Um, I'm I'm going to have you guys stand up if you can, if you desire to. Uh, for, the, for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, right? So here's, here's what we're going to read. Here's where we're going to start. He says, Comfort, comfort my people, says, our, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. God, you are an incredible God. Thank you for the gift of the communion of Lord's table, of the sacrifice that you gave, the blood life that you provide for us. You are an amazing God. Thank you for this passage. God, I pray that if there's anything in my mind that is not right, that you would remove it and replace it with what you say is right. If there's a word that would come out of my mouth, that you would change it as it vibrates through my lips and it would sound differently whenever it comes out. God, I pray that you will prepare our ears 
that we will hear not from this tainted voice, but from you. And that voice that you give would penetrate to our very core, to our heart, and change us from the inside out. So much so that it affects our hands and our feet. And it makes us do things that we would not normally in our normal self do, but we will do in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are in control of this time. This is your time you created. It is your people. You've made them. It's your sermon. You wrote it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as the screen says, uh, the title for today is Preparing the Way. All right, so preparing the way. So let me just, just really quickly, um, what have you guys been doing to prepare? There's a holiday coming up. I know in our society now, um, they're big on holiday, but they won't name it. It's funny, I've never seen, um, I don't know, fall, so, fall equinox presents or winter solstice presents. I always wonder, so what holiday are you talking about? Do you all happen to know what holiday that is? Anybody? What, 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 what were we celebrating here in a couple weeks? Christmas, right. Goodness gracious. I mean, why can't we just say it? It's a, it's a Christmas parade, for heaven's sake. It's silly. Anyway, uh, so what have y'all been doing to prepare for, for Christmas? Anyone? What have y'all been doing? Come on. I know y'all do stuff. I know you do a lot of stuff. What have you been doing? Shopping. What? Advent calendar. Cool, yep. Got the tree, knocked the thing down, hung tinsel on it. What else? Decorating, yeah. What? Yes, <laughs> that is true. There were a lot of sugar, sugar cookies made yesterday, and only a few of them survived till today. That's, that is a true thing. That is a true thing. Uh, what else? Anything else? So y'all been preparing? Y'all been preparing stuff? What about, it? like, if you go on a trip? What do you do when are you getting ready for a trip? You pack, right? You look at the weather forecast, see what the weather's going to be like. What do I need to do? What else? If you're part of my my family, you prep some food because you don't want to eat the food there. Uh, It costs too much to eat out, so we cook at home, right? So we prep some food. What about like um, high school folks? There's some high school people here. So what have you, you been doing getting ready to get out of high school? Looking at colleges? Right? You're prepping, taking, make sure you got your right classes done, looking for a job that you might have to do. There's all these things. What about cooking dinners? Very simple. If you're, if you're going to eat, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to have a list. You're going to check it twice. You're still not going to have everything you need, and you're going to go back again to Aldi because it's really fast to go there and get your stuff, right? So you prep. You prep stuff. You get some stuff ready. It's amazing that we do all these things to prepare, like a wedding. We have so much planning that goes into a wedding, a baby, baby showers, all that stuff, birthday parties. Oh my goodness, a whole list of things, people that you got to invite, things you got to do. We do all these things for preparations, making preparations for this thing that's going to happen. So no matter what we're doing, we tend to spend a lot of time getting ready for that event. The more important the event, the more important the preparation. The longer term the event, the longer and more precise the, and more detailed the preparation needs to be. All right? Now, hopefully you can see sort of where I'm going with this already. Uh, I don't know if that was eyes rolling or putting your heads down, um, but I think some of you are picking it up. This event that we're prepping for is a major event. It's an eternal event, so therefore we should be prepping for it much more so than an annual Christmas celebration, much more so than a birthday celebration, much more so than dinner, much more so than a trip, because this trip you ain't coming back from. When Jesus comes back, you go, and you're never coming back. It's an eternal trip. Whatever happens when Jesus comes back on the second advent, the game is over, and you're going to live the rest of eternity with whatever you have prepared for up to that moment in time. So it seems like we should be preparing a little bit uh, bef- before his return comes. So that's the idea of this passage. We're going to look at preparing the way uh, and look and see what Isaiah said. We're going to look and see how John the Baptist claimed it. We're going to see how it applies to us today. So let me just give you a little bit of historical background to this. Uh, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah can be separated into two, two sections, two main sections. The first part goes from chapter 1 to chapter 39. 
The second section starts at chapter 40, which is where we are, and it goes to chapter 66, which is the end of the book. All right, so this begins, chapter 40 is the beginning of the part of Isaiah where he talks about the end time restoration of Israel. All right? That's what the rest of the book is. From chapter 40 all the way to 66, what we're talking about is the restoration of Israel as they look at it. Now, included in that restoration time period, included in the rest of time from Isaiah's perspective, is the messianic era, the millennial kingdom, the end time, the new heavens, new earth, all of that is packed into chapters 40 to 66. Sometimes it's hard to discern what he's talking about because a lot of those are blended within the same chapter, even within the same verse, within the same sentence, he will have something about the millennial kingdom, and he'll have something about the restoration of Israel, and he'll have something about the, the end time, and he'll have something about the, the, the everlasting state, all of it packed in. So it's blended very much even so within the sentences. Now, in this passage, specifically this one, we see represented in the New Testament. If you didn't know, like, Revelation is like 70-80% of it's quoted from the Old Testament. It's not new stuff. It's stuff that they looked at in the New Testament and said, this is what God said then. So guess what? That's what he means now. So if it's something that he said then, it's still good for us now as for the New Testament writers and now as for us sitting here on December 4th, 2022. So it's good for us to look at. Now, in the New Testament, we see much of Isaiah. We see it in the Gospels. We see it in Paul. We see it in Revelation. It's continuously there, specifically what we're, the passage that we're going to key on today, prepare the way. That is in all four Gospels. It's in the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's in the book of John. All of it coming out of the mouth of John the Baptist. So we're going to look and see what he says. Here's an example. It's in John chapter 1, verse 23. And this is John the Baptist speaking, and that's the he. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah said. So there is John heralding the beginning of the full restoration of Israel, the blessing that's going to come to God's people. Now, the idea that, that they're talking about is the wilderness that lie to the east of Jerusalem. That is the direction from which the children of Israel came whenever they came in a sort of circuitous route from Egypt. Uh, into the promised land. That's the way that they were invaded from. As kings of, of that time would, would come into an area, they would make the wilderness look nice. They would make the highway look nice so that the king could come on a, on a, on a pretty road. We see it today. When our, if we have some delegate come from some sort of government, we clean up the street. We put flags out. We do stuff to make it look nice. We hide who we really are, all the dirt and grime that happens to be there, to make it look nice for the king so that he thinks that that's the way we're supposed to be. That's sort of the idea that they used to do. They would make things look nice. Well, what, what John the Baptist is talking about is something completely different because what he's talking about is not making things look nice even though the king knows that it's horrible. He's not saying just look good on the outside. He's saying, I want you to do something else. He looks at this passage, and he's going to key on something a little bit different. He's not talking about making yourself look good. He's talking about actually rebuilding your highway of holiness. He's talking about returning to a living style, a perspective, a worldview that proclaims that Jesus is Lord and not the things of the world. That's where he's going to go. So let's look at the passage from the beginning, uh, just for the sake of context, and then we're going to get to the focal part of the message. So I'm going to start in verse uh, 1, and we're just going to exegete, we're going to go through and just sort of pull some pieces out of it, just so you can see where this passage is going. And then we're going to land on verse 3, and we're going to sit there for a little bit, all right? So here's, I'm going to reread verses 1 and 2 again. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Let me just pause there for just a second. Says your God. He says, comfort. Oh, that's not enough. I need to say it a second, second time. Comfort. Now, why would he say that? Well, at this point in time, Isaiah is talking to a kingdom, and they've already seen their northern brothers of Israel dispatched. Sennacherib, they've already been taken to Assyria. They're gone. Never to be seen again. Those tribes of Israel, gone. We don't know where they are. 
they just got destroyed. They got taken away, disseminated. They never returned. Judah is still in existence, but Syria, Babylon, everybody's knocking at the door. Nobody's very happy. Judah is very small now. They've got their buffer zone taken away. They're not living in peace. But what does God say? He says, comfort, comfort my people. So here's what he's saying. If you are my people... Remember, and he says right there, your God. So what he's keying on is a relationship. It's amazing whenever you have a relationship, what you can walk through without recognizing. I had one child, um, um, still have that child, but many years ago she was much smaller than she is now, and she used to walk to school. This happened to be in Japan, and there's this place that she liked to go on the way to school, and it was, it was, it was on a hillside. And you know how sometimes the road goes this way and then they build up the retaining wall next to it, right? And then they put like some, a path, like concrete block about that tall on the top of it, right? Yeah. So, uh, and sometimes kids like to walk on the concrete path instead of on the ground. And the problem is as the hillside goes down, the wall comes up. And so I had this one child and she would w- walk up, walk up. Now I instigated it. I said, yeah, go ahead, go up there and walk on it. That's fine. And she'd get a little bit scared sometimes that she got a little bit higher up because the wall ended about shoulder height. And now she's standing up on this, on this retaining wall about this high. And we would, I said, no, go ahead, go ahead, go on, go on up there. Go ahead, walk up there. Now I instigated it, but, but as we continued to do it, like she was excited about it. She liked doing it. We'd get to this place and she knew that we're almost at school and she'd voop. And so what we did at the end of it, when it got to about shoulder high, I'd go down there and the first time I was like, come on, come on, baby, you can jump. Come on, come on. Baby, we don't want to jump. Come on, you can jump. Baby, I don't want to jump. I won't walk back down. No, no, come on, daddy, I'll catch you. And here comes the jump, right? She didn't trust me the first time. However, because of the relationship that we built, here's what ended up happening. Sometimes it almost ended in like splattering child on the concrete. It was incredible. She would run up that thing and get to the end and not even slow down and zoom, jump. And a couple of times I'm like, I'm not there yet. And I had to reach out and kind of catch her because she's jumping. Why? Because even in the midst of that trouble, she established a relationship. We had a relationship that she jumps, I catch doesn't matter how dangerous it might happen to be, but if you know that someone's there to catch you, then you don't mind jumping. In the midst of the turmoil of your life, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how bad it happens to be. If you know that he's there and you've established a relationship that says, you're going to catch me because you have called me to go up to this place, I don't mind jumping. Comfort, comfort my, my people, says your God even in the times of trouble. He says, tell her that her warfare has ended. Well, why are they being comforted from? From their warfare. Is it over? No, sure isn't. (laughs) They're about to get decimated as far as the world looks at it. But where's your faith? Where's your world? Who do you count as your reality? Your warfare has ended. I'm going to give you peace. That's what he says. Her iniquity is pardoned. I'm going to give you forgiveness. I'm going to give you mercy. You have received from the Lord's hand double for all your sins. Grace is made available to you. Is that a present tense thing that happened to them at that moment? No. Is that present tense now with you? No. But the reality is all things are now. All things are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing that he said will happen to you has in fact happened to you. You will be forgiven of your sin, therefore the sins are forgiven. You will have eternal life, so therefore you have eternal life. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, then all those promises are current. So even in the midst of the turmoil, you can say, yes, I have peace, I have forgiveness, I have a promise, I have mercy, I have grace. Not because I'm living it in reality of the present world, but because I live it in the reality of my faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the, like the little part that he opens up, and there's so many sermons in that passage. I almost jumped into one, but I don't have time for all that. And that's not the topic of today's point, all right? So I had to move on. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted you to sort of get the context of what God's coming to Because he's saying, my people, your God. If you miss that, you're not going to catch what's about to happen. All right. So 
he's not addressing, if you, if you follow, he's not addressing the populated masses here. Uh, he's, and he's not even addressing all of Israel. He's not even addressing all the people in the temple. So in parallel, he's not addressing all of the United States. He's not addressing all the people in the church. He's not even addressing all the people that resonate. He's making an offer. But he knows that people in the United States, people that go to church, people here at Resonate, you're not his people. He's not your God. He knows that. You don't have to hide it. Fix it. But you don't have to hide it. He knows it. What's about to come clear in this passage is what he's about to do. There's an overwhelmingly obvious point that he's going to make here. He's about to address people who are interested in the preparation of his visitation. That's what he's about to do. So let's look and see what he's doing. Our focal passage is in verse 3. And here's what he says. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert, in the desert a highway for our God. Now, have you ever been in a desert? Who, who's been in a desert? <laughs> I know where some of y'all were in a desert. <laughs> Um, deserts are interesting places. I've experienced three different... I've been in the desert in Yemen. I've been in the desert in, uh, here in the United States. And I've been in the desert in Japan. D- did y'all know there's a desert in Japan? Did y'all even know that there's a desert? Do y'all know there's a desert in Japan? Okay. There's a desert in Japan. It's really cool. It's very small. But it's a desert. They have camels and everything. It's really incredible. Very different type of desert. There's some things about a desert. Now, imagine their time frame of a desert. Okay, transport yourself, heat, silence, despair if you don't have water and food. What would that be like? Imagine out of, out of nothing, out of the desert wind, out of the shifting sand, out of the heat, out of the emptiness, there comes a voice. What would that voice do for you. You know, I, I like talkbacks. So, what would that voice do to you? Comfort. Why? You're not alone. Someone's there talking in the midst of your desert, in the midst of your wilderness. There's a voice. Notice he doesn't say city. A lot of hustle and bustle in the city. Not so much in the desert. Not a lot of places you got to hurry up and get to. If you run up that sand dune, you know what's on the other side of that sand dune? Another sand dune. Yeah. Not a lot of hustle and bustle. You get there when you get there. Not a lot of noise either. Sound of the wind. So what's he doing? There's not a lot of people out there. It's very secluded. You may feel like you're alone in your desert following Jesus. You may feel like you're alone following all the prescriptions that he's given you how to live a a life in accordance with him. But then he speaks in the middle of your desert, in the midst of your wilderness. Now what he's doing here, he's making a major announcement. Picture this. He's about to make the biggest announcement that's ever been made in the most desolate location that you could imagine. A major announcement of unimaginable impact, of immeasurable importance, in a place where almost nobody is going to hear it. Why would he be doing that? The reason we find in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, this is what he says to Isaiah. Isaiah says, hey, Lord, send me. Who's going to go for us? That's what God says. Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. What am I supposed to do? And he said, this is what you're supposed to do. Go and say to this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy They're blind and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. This is what's happened to Israel. They've lived so much with the presence of the Lord that they're bored with the presence of the Lord. Well, how's that possible? We lived in, in the Rockies 
for a, a year, only one year. We got there the first day. It's like, oh my goodness, wow, look at that. The whole, the front range is incredible. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at the colors. Blah, blah. The first, at the end of the first month, well, those are pretty cool. In the second month, mountains. About four months down the road, is there any other color rather than brown? You get bored. What, what you thought was magnificent, you get bored with over time. They'd gotten bored with it. They're dull to it. That's the same thing that's happened to the United States. It's very much happening within the church. Bored, dull. And church in general. The sorrow that I have because of this passage is dramatic and similarly, similarly personal. It's dramatic because here there's a, this passage of incredible significance. Incredible blessing, but yet there's blindness with disregard and ignorance that people, they just pass over and don't care. Our ears are dull. Our eyes don't see it. It's boring. It's another Christmas. It's personal because I've been there. It's painful to be bored with the Almighty creator of all things. That's who Israel was. That's why he speaks to us today. That's why it's still vibrant today. The coming of the Messiah was of universal importance and eternal consequence, but only a few people would be prepared to hear and discern the message. It's amazing that he would do that. Consider what we see in the New Testament. The time of Jesus is coming. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He says this. He says, He was in the world and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own people, but His own people did not receive Him. Were they prepared? They thought they were. Pharisees, Sadducees said they were. They did everything they were supposed to. They tithed 10% of their mint. They did, all the, they did follow all the laws. Everything... Uh, Paul says, according to the law, blameless. I did everything correct, but yet he wanted to kill everybody that was associated with Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. I wonder if he came into the building, if we didn't even recognize him, or if we welcome him. Do we see him? Do we, do we yearn for him? Are we ready for our eyes to see his coming. The question today is the same question that was asked thousands of years ago. Are you prepared? Are you prepared to hear and respond properly to the proclamation of the Messiah's arrival? Are you, are you ready? Think about the statement. Prepare the way. That's why he asks. Prepare the way. Now, consider what he's asking or what he's saying. He's saying, prepare the way. Now, he's God. Could it be possible that he needs you to make that road ready, make it all pretty, hang, fly, hang flags out, uh, banners, crosses? Does he need something? Is he going to stub his toe if he steps on a rock? Is that a possibility? Not a possibility. So what he's doing, he's directing this squarely as a challenge not prepare the way so that my way will be easier. But he's doing it as a challenge to the people that are around him. That's what John is doing. John the Baptist states this and he says, you need to prepare yourself. Don't prepare the nation. You need to prepare yourself. For Isaiah, the people that were in rebellion and turmoil in the Old Testament, that's what he was doing. Prepare yourself for what the Lord is about to do. It's about to be incredible. For John in the New Testament, those, those people who thought they were religious... But yet they were blind guides. They weren't ready, but they thought they were. Consider the Pharisees, Sadducees. Hypocrites is what he says. Pharisees, Sadducees, hypocrites. The people that knew the Scripture the best were the ones who were, were prepared the worst. I don't know how this happens to us as well. He challenges us the same way he challenged them. The Old Testament, they failed. They didn't prepare. New Testament, they failed. They didn't prepare. So what about you? What about us? Are you prepared to hear and respond properly to the Messiah's coming? Now, this passage, 
John quotes it, um, and it's recorded in all four Gospels, as I said earlier. And since John quotes it and applies it, that means his interpretation has to be the proper interpretation. So if John interprets it, his interpretation is correct, we need to see how John interpreted it and what he's actually saying so we understand the passage in Isaiah. So what is John saying? Very simple. He was, he was pretty candid. I mean, anybody that's walking around eating locusts, wearing camel's hair and all that, it's not like he's hiding a whole bunch in his trunk, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, he, he, whatever, whatever it is, that's what he's going to say. So what do you say? Repent. That's the message that he had. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was, that was his message. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to him and said, Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not that. No, no, I'm not that. Who are you? I'm the voice in the wilderness proclaiming, Prepare the way of the Lord. How do you do that? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what's he talking about? The word repent. If you've been in church, you've heard this word. If you haven't been in church, you probably haven't heard this word so much. Or if you have, it's been applied in a probably a... Um, heavy-handed, uh, controlling sort of way. Let me break down and show you what it, what it means, all right? Repent, uh, it's, a, it's a militaristic type of word. It means to do an about-face. Re- it means to turn around, go the opposite way. So repentance is turning away from something and turning to something. All right, away from what? Usually we talk about the sins that you commit. Most of the time, whenever it's used, they say, well, you need to repent from that. You need to repent from that. You need to re- There's about 5,000 things you need to repent from. There's 680 rules that you need to repent about. There's so much, stuff, so much stuff that you need to repent from. That's not the word repentance. That's not salvific repentance. Yeah, there's some things that we do and we need to ask forgiveness for. But he says repent, not ask forgiveness. What's the difference? Glad you asked. Salvific repentance means to repent from not believing in Jesus as Lord. That's the one singular thing that he's talking about repentance from. That is the only sin that can condemn you to hell. Not all the other stuff. So when he says repentance, he's talking about turning away from anything else that would spiritually have authority over your life, any other Lord that you've appointed over your life, and turn to Jesus in order so you can give him total authority over your life. It's not particularly cleaning up your life and making your life better. It's not stopping doing all those bad things. Now, those things tend to be the result of repentance, but they are not repentance. You don't repent from drinking, carousing, lying, stealing, cheating, blah, 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 blah. You ask forgiveness for those things. You repent from making someone else Lord of your life, And you turn so that you make Jesus the Lord of your life. And in response to that, he starts cleaning up your life. So you start not doing those things that you were doing or doing the things that you were not doing. Good? So what he's saying is your problem is that you don't make me the Lord of your life. All those other things are just symptoms. When you go to the doctor, if you have a major problem, Do you want them just to take care of the symptom or do you want them to take care of the disease? Which one? You want them to take care of the disease. If you try to make yourself stop doing all those things, all you're doing is practicing asceticism. That's what the Pharisees, Sadducees, hypocrites, Essenes, scribes, that's what they did. That's what much of the church does today and it's messed up. That's what we proclaim to the people around us, and it's messed up. See, what we offer to most of our society and most of our culture is rules, laws, not a relationship, not a Lord. We need to major on Lord, minor on laws. That's what we need to do. If you practice repentance in all your deeds all you're doing is practicing asceticism let me walk you down this pathway and show you how destructive it is to our church and our current culture if you work on asceticism that means all you're trying to do is control your flesh 
You're working on the works of your flesh, whether they be bad before you were a believer or bad now after you're a believer. All right? You're working on a deeds-based repentance. I'm sorry that I did these things. Why did you do them? Oh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what I did. Please forgive me from that, Lord. Oh, whatever. You're still going to hell. I'll heal you, but you're still going to hell. Look at what Jesus did. The people that he healed from blindness. Did it have an eternal value? One out of ten. Only one came back and thanked him. All the people that he healed, you know what happened to them later? They all died. Lazarus died twice. Poor guy. Doesn't fix anything. The deeds that you do only show the belief that you have. If you practice asceticism, and if you preach asceticism, what you do is you encourage a deeds-based repentance. Now, what happens if someone gets saved based on a deeds-based repentance? Huh? Anybody? What do they then create? What? Deeds-based faith. You know why our church doesn't understand salvation by grace? You know why the church in general doesn't understand giving your life to Jesus? It's because we taught them a deeds-based repentance, and therefore they have a deeds-based, works-based faith that says, if I do these things, then He will accept me. I did this bad, so therefore I had to do more good. No, no, no. You need to know the Lord. You need to have His life within you. Let him cleanse those things. Let him change the deeds of your life. That's what hurts us. Deeds-based repentance, deeds-based salvation. Isaiah, John, Jesus, they all talk about repentance that goes much deeper. Much deeper. It goes to the very core of your being. It goes to your belief system. It goes to your worldview. It goes to your soul. That is repentance, my friends. That is repentance. When your soul repents, when your soul repents, what you'll find is that you're, you don't have to ask forgiveness for your hands because your soul is attached to your hands. Repent from your soul. Prepare your soul. Then you don't have to practice asceticism. I have a good friend. He said, you know, I do as much cocaine as I want to. I can, man, I can just do as much cocaine as I want to. You know what I found? I don't want to. He used to be a coke addict. He gave his life to Jesus. His want to was removed. It's amazing what happens. Now, I know that doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't happen all the time. But the point is, your soul is what needs to repent. Here's my question. The main question in the whole sermon I'll work my way out from here. Here's the main question. Will you turn away from giving your life to the world and will you give your life to Jesus? Will you turn away from giving your life to the world and will you give your life to Jesus? That's the only way you can prepare. That is the repentance that produces salvation. Not cleaning your life up, not doing good stuff. Consider what John proclaims to be what John proclaims to be preparation. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. He says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now keep that last phrase in mind. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Quickly, this is what he talks about. Repentance. I just talked about that. He says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Talked about that. Covered it. Let's move on. Kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom of man. Interesting. The kingdom of heaven. If you notice... All of them, Jesus, John, this passage, Isaiah, all of them, they directly confront the desire of mankind to rule and have supreme authority over themselves and over everything else. The kingdom of heaven is a, not your kingdom, not his kingdom, not some political party's kingdom, not your boss's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so John, Jesus, all of them, they, they viciously, they constantly attack the religious leaders who were guarding their own honor through the works that they did, even though internally they were spiritually putrid. The message is the same as today. The kingdom of heaven is a hand. Not the kingdom of man. Not your man, not your kingdom. We are called to surrender kingship of our own kingdoms for the honor 
for the honor of being servants of His kingdom. Continuing in Matthew 3, he says this in 8, 8 through 10. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's he saying? Simple. Bear fruit. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What does he mean? Well, the fruit that you bear is going to look like the vine that you're attached to, but that's John 15. That's a different sermon. I can't go there. But you need to look like the vine that you're attached to. You're going to produce the fruit from which your genetics came. Now, let me ask you this very simple question. Again, rhetorical. It's not rhetorical. I'm expecting some answers. What is a, consider the process of fruit bearing, okay? Um, think of a tree. How much benefit does the tree get from producing fruit? Nothing. Nothing. Have you ever seen a tree eat its own apple? Have you ever pulled, well, this is not true because I've gotten slapped by a branch. Uh, I was going to say, have you ever pulled an apple off a tree and got hit by the tree for taking its apple? I have. I pulled the wrong direction. I pulled the apple tree and the branch slapped me in my face. So, you know, that does happen on occasion. But does, it, does a tree fight back when you pull its fruit away? No. How much benefit does a tree get for growing its fruit? How much? Nothing. Matter of fact, the more fruit it gets, the more, the more often you pull it off, the better it grows. Here's my question. When you consider bearing fruit, are you desiring to keep some of the benefit? Ooh, good. I wanted that oomph. Someone gave me an oomph over here. That means it landed. Consider the selflessness of a tree. It bears fruit, and it sees its highest accomplishment, the ultimate glory that it can possibly have, and having all of its fruit devoured by other people other than itself just so that it can go through the struggle and the strife of doing it again next season. Hmm. Can you bear fruit like that? Bear fruit. In keeping with repentance. Don't build stuff up into your own kingdom. It's God's kingdom. Don't try to hold on to the benefit. Give it to the Lord. Don't serve the world. Serve Him. Bear fruit. Then he says, stone or spirit. God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. There's no doctrine that says you can inherit relationship with Jesus Christ through uh, the relationship you have with your parents. You're not going to get an earthly family buy-in you don't just get it, salvation, because you're born into a Christian family. It's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship comes only through giving your life to Jesus and then receiving His life in return. He's the only one that gives life. Not your parents. His blood, His sacrifice. Not good works. He's the only one that can give it. So this is a massive proclamation that, that Isaiah has made that then John fulfilled. Massive. Repent. Bear fruit. Oh, but I don't want to. I like my kingdom the way it is. Is there really something like this going to happen? Can I have faith? Well, I want to read something in an extended fashion. It's a long passage, but it's been waiting on me this week. It's been very heavy on me as I've been prepping for this passage. And I wanted to preach the whole thing, but obviously I can't preach an entire chapter. I probably could, but y'all would get bored. It's Isaiah chapter 40, the entire chapter. I think we need to hear the conversation that, that God has here. Um, especially if you're sitting here right now trying to decide, do I follow the world? Do I keep my allegiance to the world? Or do I repent from following the world and do I follow Jesus? Does he have anything to offer me? Does he really have anything to offer me? Because I really don't know, Hoyt. I don't know if he has something to offer me better than what the world has. If that's you, I want to read this passage because it, 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 it continues from where we ran and it gives a challenge. 
and it speaks to us. So as we read this passage, I'm going to pray that you are overwhelmingly convicted of the awesomeness of God. Tim, your team can go and come on up here as I read this. I want you to see the awesomeness of God and the insignificance of mankind, the insignificance of the world. See how little you have to repent from to give away the world and how great your reward is when you receive the Lord. I want you to see what the grace of Jesus Christ is that spans the gap between the world and salvation. Are you ready? Here we go. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. So a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places will be plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? That all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up on a high mountain, O Zion. Herald the good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of the good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and His arm rules for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him and His recompense before Him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the water in the hollows of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord or what man shall give him counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are accounted as the dust of scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon, it would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness can you compare with him? An idol? The craftsman casts it. A goldman, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that won't rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who sits on the circle of the earth. Its its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem not taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. The tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings out the hosts by the number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, 
He increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. We have an incredible God. Non-comparable to anything else. How can we make little of Him and make much of our world? Do you not see how you rob yourself of the possibility of a relationship with glory? Prepare you the way of the Lord. Repent from following your desires of your own kingdom in this world because you've cheapened yourself. You make castles in the sand when the Lord Almighty has prepared a feast for you in heaven. He has so much that's made available to you. The altar is available. His grace is sufficient. Your repentance is called for. There's nothing else other than your words that we can say to you, O Lord. Bend our hearts, bend our knees, break our souls so that you can fill them up. Allow us to see the glory of serving in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why don't you stand with us in response? How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who led to save me and walk with him for all eternity. See that verse again? How I long to breathe the air of heaven when pain is gone and mercy fills the street. sang through doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him there
Let's sing that third verse with just the guitar. And on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. our God, who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. We have a great God who welcomes you into his throne room. We have a great God who came and sacrificed for you and then defeated death for you, who offers you his life. It's not about Christmas and a tree. It's about a Savior and an empty tomb. He offers that to you. Don't leave and enter into the world if you have conviction on your heart. Don't leave and placate whatever's going on in your soul. Don't go and anesthetize the pain that God is drawing out within you. Stay here. Talk to somebody. We're going to have a, a prayer team over here off to the side. If you don't want to come up front, that's fine. Go over there and find them. They'll pray with you. Then go out and resonate God's love. And that preparedness that you have, resonate it to all the people that you see. You are loved. There will be a day.